now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by this son of York. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Ear Read This, a podcast providing critical introductions to our favourite works of literature. I'm Ash, your host, and today I'm talking about Richard III by William Shakespeare. And a fair, well-spoken day it is too, one that's been in the works since last summer when I first began this series of episodes on Shakespeare's Plantagenet history plays. We started off this journey with a prequel of two Edwards, Christopher Marlowe's Edward II, and a play divisively held as Shakespeare's Edward III. Then, moving forward in King order, we've looked at the story of Richard II's usurpation, the embittered reign of Henry IV, the victories of his son, Henry V, and most recently, the Wars of the Roses, which blighted the reign of Henry VI. Now we mark how well the sequel hangs together. We are in 1471, in the aftermath of King Henry's murder by Richard, Duke of Gloucester. Richard's brother, Edward, is on the throne, but near death with sickness. England looks set to be once more governed by a child, Edward's son, the young Prince of Wales. But not if his uncle Gloucester has his way. For this is the story of bloody Richard clawing his way to the throne. With terrible, irresistible bravado, Richard promises us he will play the villain, and he stands apart from the other kings in being flagrantly devious and far more intimate and conspiratorial with us, the audience. In his famous opening speech, Richard teases like an impresario, like a playwright himself, that plots has he laid, inductions dangerous, by drunken prophecies, libels and dreams, to set my brother Clarence and the king in deadly hate the one against the other. Unlike the three parts of Henry VI, where many characters were making designs upon the throne and vying to be the central character in each play, Richard III is appropriately monomaniacal. Richard dominates the play, whether on stage or off it. There is no relief from the events he sets in motion and no subplot to the one he has laid. This is despite the fact that for the first three acts, Richard is not yet king. All our previous kings have had their rule assured by the start of their own plays, but here we see the rise before the fall. This is one way the play more closely resembles a tragedy than a chronicle history, and it was indeed printed in its quarter edition of 1597 as The Tragedy of Richard III. Critics have tended to see the play as a distinct advancement in Shakespeare's powers. Those who disapproved of Henry VI onstage violence and repetitive battle scenes a gratified to witness this even more violent of plays does most of its killing off stage, and has but one battle at Bosworth, where Richard is doomed to become the last English ruler since the Norman Conquest to be killed in combat. First written in about 1592 or 93, Richard III has been suggested by some critics as the first Shakespeare play to be written by him alone. It is with this play, writes Anthony Burgess, that Shakespeare makes an approach to the three-dimensional drama, in which men are not always what they seem. For the first time, the unconscious mind is netted and landed. Today, we discuss the troubled chronicle history of Richard and how Shakespeare manipulates time and memory in this study of conscience, providence and role-playing. Throughout this series of episodes on the history plays, we've often returned to one of Shakespeare's favourite themes, a theme of warning against the dangers of forgetting one's history, of letting people distort public memory to their own ends with skilful political language. It is a warning that rebounds on the theatre itself and is in full show in this most self-reflexive of plays. And I'm delighted to be joined by a guest who has a lot to say on the subject of forgotten language and its recreation, Ben Crystal. Ben is an actor and author who has performed Shakespeare around the world. He has written several books on Shakespeare, including Shakespeare on Toast, Ben is also known for his work on original pronunciation, the study and practice of producing Shakespeare in the dialect it was originally performed in. For more about original pronunciation and Ben's work elsewhere in Shakespeare studies, tune in again next time for our follow-up interview. In the meantime, check out the episode description box below for links to Ben's publications and our own Patreon page, 
where you can access bonus content while supporting the podcast. I began our conversation by asking Ben what pre-existing notions Shakespeare's audiences may have had about Richard III. Was he at this point notorious, a kind of pantomime villain for the Elizabethan age? That's a really difficult question uh, because, we, you know, trying to work out the mindset of Shakespeare's audience in the Shakespeare's globe is, you know, you can spend a lifetime guessing what that <laughs> might be like. And, and I've spent mm. a good chunk of mine so far trying to. Certainly what we know now from the Richard III Society is their belief that the Richard that Shakespeare painted in the play Richard III is not true to their understanding of, of what the real King Richard III was like. And I suppose we always have to try to remember that even with the, the histories or the true histories, as, as they're often called, is that they are works of theatre. And theatre doesn't work without conflict. There is no drama without conflict, goes the old adage. Mm. So whoever he was and however he behaved, <laughs> what we end up with, as you say, is this almost pantomimic uh, villain. And there will have been some imaginative bridge between the reality and the fiction or the reality and the fantasy, I suppose. Certainly the creation that Shakespeare made is really successful. I mean, yeah. it's one of the most well-known characters. It's got some of the most famous uh, lines, you know, a horse, a horse, and now is the winter. And, and you know, the famous scene between him and Anne. And, and it's one of the the jewels in the crown of acting Shakespeare for, for men and women and non-binary actors. So Shakespeare's creation, really successful. The Richard, according to the Richard III Society, quite different, wouldn't have made as successful a lead character. And I think that's probably true to most human beings. You know, like we're, the, the whole point of theatre is to reduce us down in some respects to our most relatable accessible or hateable elements and and to hold the mirror up but it, it's only been in the last 40 or 50 years that we've really wanted to see as it were like true life you know kitchen sink drama the stuff that came out of the court in the 60s and mm -hmm. onwards so i'd imagine we're getting some kind of villainous superhero version of richard the third <laughs> um, the story would have been familiar to Shakespeare's audience and the history right. as well. <laughs> and, and I think they would have relished and enjoyed uh, being discomfortable supporting such a, a, a villainous character. Mm. I think they would have enjoyed it. But whether or not that would have been the Richard they would have grown up hearing stories about or not, yeah, we're just not going to know. Whilst writing Richard III, Shakespeare was once again drawing on those steadfast sources of his, the Chronicles of Hollinshed and Hall, who portray Richard as a usurper, a notorious tyrant, who had his young nephews murdered in the Tower. This was the traditional Richard in line with Tudor propaganda. It is, after all, Queen Elizabeth's grandfather, Henry Tudor, at the end of the play who defeats Richard at Bosworth and restores England to smooth-faced peace. The portrait of Richard in Hollinshed and Hall itself derives from the work of Thomas More, Lord Chancellor in the time of Henry VIII. More's history of King Richard III is another of Shakespeare's sources, providing not only details of plot, but the character of the king. More describes Richard as close and secret, a deep dissimular, lowly of countenance, arrogant of heart, outwardly companionable where he inwardly hated. C.W.R.D. Mosley writes that for Shakespeare, more is more than a source, which only gives a man something to write about. He is a major influence as well, suggesting how the writing may be done. The Richard of Thomas More's account, born feet first and full of teeth, is a witty and ironic creation, a political performer of great theatricality. By adapting More's Richard for the stage, Shakespeare turned a piece of pure propaganda into a coup de théâtre, a character who could smile and play the villain while asking who or what had cast him in such a part. The critic A.P. Rossiter disagreed with E.M.W. Tilliard's focus on the Tudor myth with the history plays, saying that where the myth offered only absolutes, certainties, 
Shakespeare in his histories always leaves us relatives, ambiguities, irony, a process thoroughly dialectical. One thing any audience member would know before watching the play is that Richard is doomed to die at Bosworth. Thus, his opening speech, where he says he will upset the course of history by proving a villain, would be heard in an ironic light. He has already been determined to be a villain by historical record, and therefore his villainies will only serve the course of history. In a similar way, Linda Chance has responded to Richard's claim that he is deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world, scarce half made up, by saying that to the contrary, Richard's problem is not that he has been sent prematurely into the world, scarcely half made up, but precisely the opposite. He has been overlong in the world, sent too often, too made up, overdetermined by repeated textual births that have rendered him too readable and his body too legible. In the previous play, Henry VI Part 3, we had a lengthy preview of Richard in a soliloquy, during which he said, Why, love forswore me in my mother's womb, and for I should not deal in her soft laws, she did corrupt frail nature with some bribe, to shrink mine arm up like a withered shrub. But in his own play, he rewrites this account, and with breathtaking audacity, blames the same withered arm on the witchcraft of his enemies. See how I am bewitched. Behold, mine arm is like a blasted sapling withered up. And this is Edward's wife, that monstrous witch, consorted with that harlot strumpet shore, that by their witchcraft thus have marked me. Linda Charms writes that Richard's construction of his personal history mimics the play's revision of his political history. Richard's struggle against the doom of destiny can be therefore seen as his attempt to hew his way out with a bloody axe from the thorny woods of his textual past. Of all the history plays, mm. um, and I've kind of been doing the, these podcasts in, in order of kings, so starting at Richard II, this one being the last one of the Wars of the Roses plays. Oh, wow, cool. Strangely, given that it's the last one and has so much build-up, almost feels like the most accessible play in isolation that you don't really need much context just to jump in is it just down to the just the fieriness of of richard or the, he's kind of the, the monster of a character that that he is yeah i think that's a really astute observation there aren't many of the history plays that do stand alone very well they're all mm. really interesting plays in and of themselves henry the sixth part one is one of my favorite plays uh, and does yeah. sort of stand alone well on itself, although not as famously as Henry V, like you say, Richard III. Um, Richard II does to a certain extent, but yeah. But you've got to wade through all of that early stuff before it, it gets going. And that can, that can seem like we've actually missed a play, mm. uh, the, the sort of setup to the beginning of Richard II and the d d dispute over the murder and that sort of thing. The Henry the Fourths are rarely produced in isolation. Henry the Fifth mm. is. You rarely, you you would be really rare to go. Oh, I've heard that the theatre down the road is performing Henry the Sixth Part Two, and only <laughs> Henry the Sixth Part Two. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing I've learned from studying or you know looking at the Henry Six plays, apart from the fact that they're brilliant. Uh, and it's a shame that they're ignored so much, is that if you attach Richard III to them, the run-up into Richard III is, inc is really incredible. I think Richard III mm. is a great piece in, it, in its own right. And, and as you say, it stands alone beautifully. Seeing Richard claw and crawl his way to that point, that, that third as it were, that last uh, chunk of Henry VI Part Three, I think makes for a better play if you attach it to the first, like, two-thirds of Richard III, because <laughs> like, the last third of Richard III is fine. But once you're getting to the bowels and Richmond, you know, and, and essentially once Richard becomes king and turns away from the audience, start, stops talking to us, the audience, and isolates himself both metaphorically and actually in his, in his crown, I think the play kind of runs out of steam a little bit. But um, in isolation by itself, I think, you know, from the very get-go, from the very beginning of Now is the Winter, you are strapped into this, this, this ride, this roller coaster. And ideally, by the end of that speech, if not halfway through that opening speech, you're falling in love with 
and are a sort of fan of Richard, no matter what he does. And in fact, you enjoy him all the more for the more terrible and horrible things and manipulations that he exercises on people. I think that is the, the, the fire, as it were, that you say that, that, that keeps people hooked into it. But there's something I, perhaps structurally or dramaturgically about the play that, that does, you know, I've just always felt it runs out of steam a little bit towards the end. Well, it is the, is it the second longest play in the canon? Some, I think after Hamlet, maybe? It's certainly one of the longest uh, lead roles. Between 1700 and 1877, Collie Kibber's Richard III was the only adaptation performed, something that continued Richard's textual distortion. Kibber's production, initially unpopular and heavily censored, turned Richard into a more straightforward monster than the character in Shakespeare's play. His violent acts are brought on stage, including the killing of his nephews. But Shakespeare, as Charles Lamb wrote in a review of Kibber's production, was not interested in monsters, but witty, clever figures who misuse their great intellect. Critics can sound rather equivocal when circling what it is that makes Richard such an attractive character in performance. There is much vague murmuring of energy and charm. You get the sense that on paper the play shouldn't work. And indeed it doesn't for critics like John Bailey, who said, No variety of business and no sweep of energy can blind us to the central weakness of the play. Richard is everything, and he is not merely incredible, he is monotonous. Already on the first page he is what he remains to the last. His villainies are born before their time, unnaturally and full-grown, out of the head of the monster who is their single parent. The great figures, Hamlet, Macbeth, Othello, grow. Richard merely is. So what makes Richard so compelling to audiences? What provokes the wild and alarming delight that William Richardson felt watching the play? Coleridge said Richard's dominant characteristic was a pride of intellect, something Edward Dowden disagreed with, saying rather it is a demonic energy of will. Some measure of the confusion about whether or not we should laugh or shudder at the play is demonstrated by Collie Kibber's hopes to use Richard as a way of transitioning from comic to serious roles. Kenneth Tynan wrote in a review of Laurence Olivier's Richard III that to tempt at all, Satan must charm us. I do not think it would be true to say that Olivier's Richard ever makes us warm to him. We never feel delight or admiration. We simply laugh, and that implies neither encouragement nor hostility, but mere acceptance of an act performed. Is that an act performed by Olivier or Richard? The tone of Richard's famous soliloquy, where he vows to prove the villain, is conspiratorial. He is letting us, the audience, into his schemes and his head. But as CWRD Mosley writes, the only thing Richard is saying about his real self is that he plays roles. He is defining himself as a shape changer. And that is exactly what he is in the subsequent action, the actor par excellence, until he can act no longer. The fate of the character is of secondary importance to the actor. At times, Richard is more concerned with luxuriating in the skill of his performance than following its purpose. Delighting in himself, he says, Shine out, fair sun, till I have bought a glass, that I may see my shadow as I pass. Richard is the kind of actor who can lose himself in a part. It has often been noticed that before the Battle of Bosworth, Richard shows great courage, delivering a rousing speech to his men, as a true king should. William Hazlitt, in a review of Edmund Keane's performance of Richard, said that he fought like one drunk with wounds. When Richard does realise that he has gone too far, and lost the freedom to play whatever role he chooses, he says, I am in, so far in blood that sin will pluck on sin. But this acknowledgement doesn't prompt him to change his ways. As Jonathan Bates says, only in his dreams does Richard stop acting, and when that happens, his identity collapses. Waking from a vision of his murdered victims, Richard asks alone, What do I fear? Myself? There's none else by. Richard loves Richard. That is, I am I. Is there a murderer here? No. Yes. I am. Richard's determination for control and to prove himself by opposition to those around him ultimately spells his destruction. As W. H. Auden has said, Richard is doomed to failure in proportion to his success because ultimately, if he controlled all souls, he'd be thrown back on 
existential anxiety. What support can he have for his own existence? He must always make enemies, for then he can be sure he exists. I, I was going to say, you, me- you mentioned the, the talking to us aspect of uh, Richard. It seems in many ways surprising that he wrote them this way round. It seems strange to think that he wrote the Hal, uh, I know you all soliloquy after Richard III. <laughs> and it's often been uh, performed as a sort of foreshadow of uh, uh, Richard III. There's something about soliloquies that just sound a bit evil mm-hmm, when they're mm-hmm. done like that. So it's, it seems strange that he wrote it afterwards. Is it just down to the success of um, <laughs> Richard III's, I guess, relationship with the audience? Wait a second. I just sort of walked in properly on what you just said. You said that soliloquies always... Just sa- just have a kind of evil tang, but is it just down to Richard? <laughs> what makes you say that? Out of interest. Well, I'm thinking particularly of that one and partic- uh, of, of Howl's, you know, I know you all, and while I'll play the fool now, I will... Oh, sure. Crown yeah. myself in glory in Henry the Fourth, Part One. I suppose, yeah, you're, you're tuning into the reveal, and mm. and I suppose whenever someone's got a card to their chest, and you're aware that they've got a card to their chest, and then they share it, it can feel like the villain revealing their master plan. I suppose, although, uh, yeah, I'm not mm, nefarious. I'm not entirely sure how 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 villainous Hal is although Falstaff might have something to say about that. This is a bit of an open question, but is is Falstaff the the closest character to Richard the 3rd before you know m- more than any of the other kings there seems something about his sort of self-delight that <laughs> <laughs> there's there's a degree I suppose you can see elements of Richard the 3rd and Richard the 2nd too. Mm. But um but I mean, y- your point though about the order is is really interesting because, as far as I understand it, the commonly held belief is that the order of writing, not necessarily the order of performing, was Henry the Sixth Part Two, Henry the Sixth Part Three, Henry the Sixth Part One, Richard the Third, Hen- uh, Edward the Third, King John, Henry the Fourth Part One, Henry the Fourth Part Two, Henry the Fifth. And then much, much, much later, Henry VIII. Uh, and Richard II, what, before? Oh, good. I've, uh, yeah. Richard... Richard II was somewhere around the sort of Midsummer Night's Dream, King John sort of period. So it would have been before Henry the. I think he wrote Richard II to Henry V in, in sort of, as it were, order. Mm. Um, and uh, it feels very much like Richard III was one of the first out of the gate soon after the... Uh, plague hit in 1592 to 1594 but some people place it earlier um it's 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 hard to say i get the feeling that he had these two tetralogies in mind or or if they weren't in mind then there was a degree of them being commissioned and if there wasn't that either there was some it feels like after a while there was a loose plan that evolved to to as it were you know do the the middle star wars trilogy and then mm. do the prequels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it definitely feels like that. In fact, during the course of talking about the, these history plays, very, several people have said, uh, you know, kind of like building a franchise, that sort of momentum picks up. Well, from a producing point of view, it's really clever because if you know that there's sequels and prequels, you're, you're, getting a, you're guaranteeing a returning audience. And in some respects, that symbiotic relationship, the, the polarisation of it is reversed because... You do a successful history play, then you do a comedy, let's say, or a tragedy, whatever. And you hear people say, I really enjoyed that that history play. I really enjoyed those characters. I'd love to see, you know, when are you going to do another one sort of thing? So we think a lot, I suppose, about Shakespeare's process and and his wants and needs as a writer and, and the wants and needs of his company, too. But at the end of the day, they were business folk and they Mm. needed bums on seats and they were probably writing to popularity. Certainly the the history plays that back in the Rose Theatre before they moved over to the Globe, um, the Rose was famous for its histories. And in some respects, if you were going to work there, then you had to front the history goods. During the 1590s, the theatre was full of English history, with rival playhouses keeping a watchful eye on each other's successes. After the Lord Chamberlain's men put on Richard III, the Lord Admiral's men quickly replied with a play called 
Richard Crookback. The fame of Shakespeare's version is attested by the numerous references to it found in subsequent plays. Richard's famous line on the field of Bosworth, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse, was, for instance, often imitated, and Peter Ackroyd has listed some of the variants cropping up in other works. A man, a man, a kingdom for a man, a boat, a boat, a full hundred marks for a boat, a fool, a fool, my coxcomb for a fool. In an earlier anonymous play, The True Tragedy of Richard III, the line appears as a horse, a horse, a fresh horse, suggesting either that Shakespeare improved it in adaptation or the fame of his own line led to its retrospective incorporation in the earlier play. The True Tragedy is thought to be a reported text, a memorial reconstruction, cobbled together from actors recalling lines. So it is quite possible that given the numerous Richard III plays that were produced in a short space of time, someone remembered a more famous line from a later version. It was Richard Burbage, Shakespeare's leading man in many of his plays, who was the first actor to take the title role. His association with the part is immortalised in a piece of anecdotal Shakespeare legend. The story goes that a female audience member was so aroused by Burbage's performance that she requested he come to her chambers that night under the name of Richard III. But Shakespeare, overhearing this, beat Burbage to the residence and when the actor arrived, he was turned away with the message, William the Conqueror came before Richard III. The popularity of the plays themselves, did that sort of extend to the characters? Do, is, is, would it be right to assume that a character like Margaret, for example, features in so many plays because she was a bit of a hit or simply because she, you know, in actual fact was around? Yeah, I think it's it's a combination of both. I think you've got, uh, cause she, like you say, I think she's probably, I was talking about this with a friend the other day. I think she might be the character that appears in most Shakespeare plays. I think she gets four or five, maybe you, you ain't, you ain't going to bring back a character that people hate. You're only yeah. going to bring <laughs> back a character that people cheer and, and in some respects are sad to see the decline of in Margaret's case, I suppose. And then, and then, you, you know, with characters like Henry V, you've essentially got your Thor or Captain, <laughs> Captain America equivalent. And um, and and a lot of these these heroes and villains would have been well. They're all, they're also reflective of of some of the childhood stories that that the Elizabethans would have grown up hearing, or or well, certainly oh, hearing really? about and maybe reading about. Oh, I mean, you know, the fall of Troy and the success of Henry at Agincourt and that kind of thing. Really f- well known folkloric mm. tales, almost. And so to see them manifest on your stage where you go many times a, a month if not many times a week would be would be up there i think in, in, in you know equivalent to our experiences of of seeing that particular actor in marvel or or, or what have you what we don't know is the degree to which they would have repeated these plays in like the 1600s would they have recast them? Would we be excited about who's going to play Henry next in the same way as we get excited about who's going to play Batman next? Uh, we don't know, but but we do know that the actors in Shakespeare's company, um, for the most part, there were, you know, there were a lot of actors that were in the company for the duration. They would have been seen playing different parts many days of the week. They would have been seen playing many different Shakespeare parts. And as an audience member, you would get to see them develop and grow and blossom over the whatever, 20 years of of your life that you're going, Mm. the 20 years that Shakespeare's writing. The canny writer would lean into that and make the most of the stories that people know, the stories they thought they knew, the tales they wanted to see, the tales they didn't think they wanted to see, and the characters he knew they would fall in love with played by actors they were familiar with that's that's sort of a perfect storm of entertainment margaret has been with us for the whole tetralogy first appearing as a young daughter of a french duke in henry the sixth part one she is now widowed and consumed with thoughts of revenge after witnessing her son's brutal murder at the hands of the new king edward the fourth and his brothers historically of course margaret wasn't there at all having long been wafted hence to france Her presence in the play isn't merely down to her character's popularity. In this play about forgotten pasts, she serves as one of recent history's rare survivors, who not only reminds characters of their crimes, but predicts their demises. 
When characters like Buckingham, Grey and Hastings are sent to their deaths, each of them reflects on the prescience of Margaret's curses. As Richard tries to rewrite the past, Margaret makes a nuisance of herself by being witness to England's long protracted suffering. Hear me, you wrangling pirates, she says. Which of you trembles not that looks on me? And Margaret is not alone in wanting the past to be remembered and justice to be performed. The other major female characters, Lady Anne, Queen Elizabeth, and Richard's own mother, the Duchess of York, are widows all and have greater cause than the ambitious men to count their grievances. Lady Anne, wife of the murdered Prince Edward, curses Richard and unwittingly herself when she says, If ever he have wife, let her be made as miserable by the death of him as I am made by my poor lord. Later, the Duchess of York, Margaret and Queen Elizabeth join together in a scene of lamentation recalling Seneca's women of Troy. Elizabeth telling Margaret, Oh, thou didst prophesy the time would come that I should wish for thee to help me curse that bottled spider, that foul bunch-backed toad. While Margaret is a source of vexation to Richard, she is a useful anchor for Shakespeare, whose chronology is typically jagged. The play opens with the arrest of the Duke of Clarence in 1477, then jumps back in the same scene six years for the burial of Henry VI. We then have 12 years crammed into six scenes, leading up to the death of Edward IV in 1483. Isolated but devastating whenever she comes on stage, Margaret functions like an embittered chorus, holding characters and history to account. You mentioned uh, uh, the part of Richard III being a kind of jewel in the crown for Shakespeare acting, and um, certain performances have oh, seem sort of immortal or, or uh, mm -hmm. uh, hard to get away from. I was going to ask you, just on a kind of personal level, do you have any particular favourite Richards? Ooh, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, let me think now. In no particular order, <laughs> uh, two I saw at the Globe and one I saw up at the Sheffield Crucible. Uh, the two at the Globe were uh, Catherine Hunter, the uh, complicite actor, who was incredible. I think it was an all-female. I believe it was an all-female company. Uh, and wonderful physicality. There was the National Theatre of China's production about three or four years ago in around 2016. And the lead actor, Zhang Dongyu, played Richard. He was physically fine until he was in soliloquy and then the disformity crept hmm. over him you know arguably it, it, his 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 deformity was in his head i suppose it was how he saw himself or how we saw him or however you'd like to to interpret it it was a really lovely choice and then um way 20 years ago nearly now i suppose i got a ticket last minute to see uh, ken branner to oh, yeah. shoot up in, in the Sheffield Crucible. And that was an extraordinary show, an extraordinary performance, surrounded by a lot of the actors that he works with a lot. And um, it was just one of those productions where every bit made real sense. He really got it. He played Richard as a, a very much a, an actor um, in, in, and was always acting in a different way to get whatever he wanted out of whoever he was talking to next, including the audience which I suppose sum, sums the part up quite nicely. It is such an actor's part. Ian McKellen's film, which yeah. starts out with that beautiful bit of, he's, he's, he's in his, he's going, he goes to the loo while, whilst they're on a break from some yeah. great event <laughs> and he's talking to the camera and you think he's all disabled and then he, just, he pulls out a cigarette lighter and yeah. click, 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 click and in a, in a flash it's, it's lit a cigarette and gone again. And I thought that was such a beautiful choice to show, yes, I'm disabled, but watch out, I have hidden tricks. It's, I, I, funnily enough, I just watched that bit just about half an hour before we started. <laughs> oh, and um, uh, I don't know if you saw Matt Fraser's Richard a few years ago. Matt Fraser's the actor born with uh, defects resulting from the drug thalidomide. And um, he, you might have seen him in American Horror Story, uh, but he did Richard a few years ago. I think he was the first... Um, it was the first mainstream production with um, a, a disabled or not regularly abled actor, and that was pretty awesome. And then, uh, oh, what was it called? Teenage Dick at the Donmar Warehouse, uh, which was like a high I've school rewriting. Daniel Monks played Richard. He was so good. He was, and and, and also, uh, you know, has grown up with 
disabilities. And um, I think it's been really interesting in the last couple of years to see the casting blossom away from you know, actors, male actors or male identifying actors that have played Hamlet and all the other parts. And now they play their Richard and to see awesome uh, fe you know, female or non-binary identifying actors and, and indeed disabled actors swinging at this part. In Shakespeare's day, the shape of the body could be read as reflecting the moral character, either as a form of divine punishment or as God's way of forewarning imminent disasters. As a result, according to Linda Charns, extraordinary attention was paid to precisely formulating and implementing the proper lines of male and female bodies, and for men especially, the performance of courtly activities such as dancing, swordplay and display riding. Enforcement occurred in infancy and youth through swaddling, binding and corsets. Tyrants like King Herod were traditionally depicted in mystery plays as being disfigured by their crimes. But Richard is not an archetype and has the consciousness to speculate at his own deformity. And by comparing his shrunken arm to a withered shrub and blasted sapling, promotes his body to the status of a cursed landscape. He has an unusual fascination with bodily violence and relishes its details. In Henry VI Part Three, upon receiving news of his father, the Duke of York's death, Edward says to the messenger, Oh, speak no more, for I have heard too much. Whereas his brother, Richard, says, Say how he died, for I will hear it all. In his own play, Richard has a sudden hunger for strawberries while arranging for the beheading of Hastings, and perhaps most ghoulishly of all, having ordered the murder of the princess in the tower, requests that the murderer come to him soon after supper and tell him the process of their deaths. When he woos the Lady Anne, his language is full of body parts, tongues, eyes and fingers, compounding the already unpleasant image of a widow wooed by a coffin with the creeping sense that he is already ogling, groping and licking her. As soon as she leaves, Richard shrugs to the audience that he won't keep her long. An outcast to his bones, here he declares he is above courtship and eroticism. This is a consequence of Richard's extreme pride in being self-made. In an even more appalling scene later on, he announces his designs on his own niece to her mother. Queen Elizabeth replies, But thou didst kill my children. To which Richard says, but in your daughter's womb I bury them, where in that nest of spicery they shall breed selves of themselves to your recomfiture. A king was supposed to have two selves, the private self and the divine self, a conceit that gives us the royal we. Richard subverts this idea not only by playing roles, but also when he recognises a kindred spirit in Buckingham, calling him my other self, my counsel's consistory, my oracle, my prophet. And Buckingham does indeed share traits with Richard, as he makes plain, I can counterfeit the deep tragedian, speak and look back and pry on every side, tremble and start at wagging of a straw, intending deep suspicion. Ghastly looks are at my service, like enforced smiles, and both are ready in their offices, at any time, to grace my stratagems. We have another riff on the multiple selves of the king when Richmond, the future King Henry VII, appears to have been replicated on the battlefield by having some of his men dress as him. Returning to the idea of Richard wrestling with his own textual past, we might imagine his distorted public image being writ large on his body, twisted and deformed by men like Thomas More, who, like the scrivener in the play, enjoys manipulating language as much as Richard enjoys playing roles. Michael Taylor says that Richard III dramatises Shakespeare's growing awareness of the sinister plasticity of language, written or spoken, particularly when it is dealing with or conveying history. In the speech I mentioned earlier following his dream before the Battle of Bosworth, Richard contorts himself with language. Is there a murderer here? No, yes, I am. Then fly. What, from myself? Great reason why, lest I revenge. What, myself upon myself? Alack, I love myself. Wherefore? For any good that I myself have done unto myself. Oh no, alas, I rather hate myself, for hateful deeds committed by myself. I am a villain, yet I lie, I am not. Fool, of thyself speak well. Fool, 
do not flatter. My conscience hath a thousand several tongues, and every tongue brings in a several tale, and every tale condemns me for a villain. As CWRD Mosley writes, the consciousness of guilt and despair in the face of it reduces a man who filled the world to a desire for nothingness. And the irony in so articulating this profound discovery is that Richard can no longer act, not even to himself. There is not even any escape into the illusory truth of metaphor, for this speech is devoid of them. The very rhetoric of the speech echoes the divisions of the self, antithesis and parallelism, isocolon, epistrophe, anadiplosis. All the figures stress the notion of division and ambiguity. Indeed, just as Richard used his body as a prop to establish himself in the first speech of the play, here, through the nature of the expression of thought, the mind is being used as a prop to indicate the nothingness at the heart of this evil man. It does seem like the part to sort of address that whole casting issue, which is constantly talked about in, in terms of sort of Shakespeare casting in particular. Because, I mean, you get, I get the impression that in... Uh, Shakespeare's day, the, uh, and certainly the characters in the play seem to regard Richard as disabled because he's evil, or vice versa. <laughs> you know, it goes hand in hand. Whereas, as society has, you know, more n nuanced set of ideas about disabilities, it's completely transformed the part and blown it wide open. It's it's amazing to see how, you know, Richard suddenly seems like not exactly a victim himself, but um, maybe like a politician exploiting. A vulnerability or something like that certainly seen and that's funnily enough one of the interpretations daniel brought into teenage dick uh, oh, at the really? Dalmar warehouse earlier this year because that they were he was being voted for high school president essentially that was their equivalent of king and there was a great degree of social media and politicking and um uh in that but you, it's interesting because you're picking up on on two very different ways into shakespeare i suppose and the one hand you've got a society in shakespeare's time that pretty much thought that disability of any kind or whether it's physical or um, you know your limbs or your body or your face in any way that in some respects you were cursed it was uh, you were cursed by god or by the devil uh, you might have been cursed by a witch that it wasn't something natural that in some ways you 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 d either deserved it or you know it's they didn't have particularly forward thinking ideas and uh, and then uh, about about disability anyway and then a couple of hundred years later and thanks to freud when we get introduced to the idea of the subconscious and all these kind of things and you know that's when people stopped seeing shakespeare's monologues and soliloquies as opportunities for the characters to talk to the audience because it was about the same time as they turned the lights off in the auditorium too <laughs> so now you've got these actors or characters who have these speeches and there's no one to talk to because the lights are down on the auditorium and they're on on the stage you can't see them and also you've got this new idea about watching the character think and having this conversation this internal monologue conversation with themselves mm. and it's much easier then to forge a bridge to oh like you know the national theater of china the disability is within the disability is a psychological disability or, or, or something like that i think what the first thing that we really hear from richard is i am not shaped for sportive tricks i cannot court i am not you know fit for most things so because i can't play a lover i'll play a villain you know he, he, is his bitterness has he been pushed to it because of the way society has treated him because of his disability is it does does the evil as it were make him more crippled or does the the the, the his crippled body push him to more evil i mean that's that's a question that's left quite nicely open in richard the third it isn't so open if you bolt on the end of Henry VI Part Three, because there he's <laughs> this young buck. Yes, he's disabled or, or, or has some sort of a physical restriction, it seems, although it's not really clearly spoken about. Some people castigate him, but he just seems to be out and down for fighting and blood and moving family forward and clawing their way up, which 
everyone was doing actually in that time, or at least it's, they seem to be in that play. There's no difference between them other than his, his physical qualities. And that doesn't seem to stop him. So I don't know whether he's evil in, in some respects, he kills and, and, and manipulates his way to the top. That's not too many dissimilar um, in, in path to Henry the Fourth to Bolingbroke, yeah. who, who also um, manipulates and kills his way to the crown. In some respects, that's the way to the crown. <laughs> Throughout these history plays, we have been forced to ask ourselves about the role of providence. In a world where an anointed king can be usurped, where two countries can go to war under the name of the same God, how are we to know who is in the right? Even Henry V, the paragon of kingliness, was the son of a usurper. In the last play, we heard his son, Henry VI, acknowledge his title was weak. But both still behaved as if they had a right to keep their throne. By contrast, Richard III revels in his wrongness, in his unsuitability. Where before Agincourt, Henry V disguised himself and went among his men to rally them, before the Battle of Bosworth, the superstitious Richard creeps among his men to eavesdrop on them. Where Henry declared the English a band of brothers, Richard declares in part three of Henry VI, I have no brother, I am like no brother. Where Henry V and VI are notably pious, Richard makes an elaborate show of piety in order to manipulate public opinion. Interestingly, however, he refers twice to Jesus, a name not often found in Shakespeare's plays. Lady Anne calls him a foul devil, saying, For God's sake hence, and trouble us not, for thou hast made the happy earth thy hell. Returning us to the theme of England as a ruined garden with this invocation of Eden. Has Richard made the happy earth his hell? Perhaps he'd like to think so. But although Richard sees himself as the one who writes the plots, hijacking the course of history, many critics have highlighted the irony that his crimes actually enact the will of heaven, paving the way to Henry VII's eventual victory. Some see this as a weakness, as a falling back on contemporary bias. Wilbur Sanders, for instance, writes, Shakespeare is at that creatively frustrating stage of his career when he has more philosophical souls on his shelves than he has dramatic bodies for them to inhabit, and the excess of disembodied ideas float like a disturbing phantom over some passages of the play. Above all, over the idea of providence, which disconcertingly allied to a naive chauvinism, leaves the closing minutes of the play sadly contracted to the stature of Tudor propaganda. Another floating phantom here is that of the vice figure from morality plays. As C.W.R.D. Mosley writes, the vice is an embodiment of evil, and in the old drama, his occurrence is perfectly explicable. But when dramatists break out of that overtly religious frame, without abandoning a figure who is theatrically so effective and popular, creates a problem. For once the religious or spiritual context is stripped away from him, the vice's evil and his motivation become rationally inexplicable. The vice figure was popular in Shakespeare's day, Falstaff is likened to a vice, and characters like Iago in Othello, Edmund in King Lear, and Aaron in Titus Andronicus are descendants of the vice. George Bernard Shaw compared Richard to another theatrical archetype, calling him the Prince of Punches. He delights man by provoking God, and dies unrepentant and game to the last. His incongruous conventional appendages, such as the punch hump, the conscience, the fear of ghosts, all impart a spice of outrageousness, which leaves nothing lacking to the fun of the entertainment, except the solemnity of those spectators who feel bound to take the affair as a profound and subtle historic study. There's, there's always a careful line to be trod with the censors, with anything that gets too close to any modern monarch that may be within memory or within easy relation you know there's 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 nothing more carefully written than henry the eighth because <laughs> because you're you you're now talking about people that that some people still alive would probably just about anyway remember oh at least within a generation you know it's henry the things that happened in henry the eighth are only 60 70 years earlier I suppose the thing with that bit, you're talking really about the, the, the dream nightmare stuff, I guess, when Rich really starts to fall apart and right towards the end of the play. And that language or that, that, that poetry 
the meter is so different from Richard's early stuff. Like you say, it's very fragmented and very much broken up. Uh, whereas Richmond is presented quite, as you say, quite traditionally, quite simply. I think that's partly down to some of the ideas that Shakespeare was starting to knock around, realizing how much he could manipulate the verse to, to, to resonate with or to reflect the character's state of mind. But also, if you imagine like the, the, what Richard has to say, all of his speeches, if you put one on top of the other, it creates something of a mountain. And mm -hmm. starting with now is the winter at the very beginning, his broad base and all of the things he does and says, you're talking about the very, very tip you know, the, the last bits. And in, in some ways, that more um, broken up or, or radical lyrical uh, style of speech that he has, it might not have worked if he'd have started with that. It sort of works better, I think, because of everything that's come before it. And Richmond, we only get to briefly meet Richmond, a bit like um, uh, a bit like Malcolm in Macbeth. Mm. You know, there's a lot of there's a it's a hard those parts are really hard work for actors because you you come on with no history, you've got to <laughs> immediately be liked, often in very brief or complicated bits of of scene. You're up against a protagonist who is towards the end of a fraying rope of a journey. Mm. and is essentially hacking and slashing and slaying in every direction it, yeah it's a tough tough part to play and i suppose metrically it makes sense uh, if 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 what richmond is saying is is relatively regular and and solid that is very similar to the kind of verse you might expect from henry v in his great moments and and that would have resonated or the very you know the very stable and regular verse that Marlowe would have been writing around the same time you know subconsciously acoustically to the audience that regular da dum 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 and on and on and on is is comforting and familiar and you're going to be yeah subconsciously signaling to the audience that this is a good guy this is a good person um and and likewise as Richard fragments and his verse fragments you will subconsciously hear that too and that's that's a trick that Shakespeare used throughout his career in different ways I, I really like the idea of the, those characters being sort of resentfully liked at the end to, <laughs> in the shadow of the much more interesting villain the sort of the Richmonds of the plays well I think yeah it, at which point do you step away you know it, 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 it's easier in some ways to look at a character like Titus who continually keeps doing terrible things and maybe you lose hold of him a little bit when he goes mad in the fly scene but then he he, he ends up cooking everyone at the end and, and you <laughs> you love him for it um mm. keeping hold of the audience as the protagonist is hard i mean hamlet hamlet is really hard in that respect because if you haven't got a really great engine behind you 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 may lose the audience in these long existential explorations of of decision making essentially and i think a lot of people may lose richard around the time he kills the princes or has the princes killed and that's also the time where he stops talking to the audience too and and, and so he's sort of he's the one that severs the relationship in some way and that's all we have time for today, folks. Tune in again tomorrow to hear more from Ben Crystal about his work with original pronunciation. I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and indeed this series of episodes on Shakespeare's history plays. Thank you as always for listening, and until next time, happy reading. Beep.